evening. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual meeting and I'd like to explain this meeting format. Tonight we have our commissioners and staff visible on a video feed. Members of the public have been invited to comment on Wheatler Speaks in advance of tonight's meeting and are also able to participate live through a web link or by calling in on the phone. You can find that information on our meeting agenda at weaverspeaks.org. All members of the public who are participating live have been muted. When it is time for public comment at the start of the meeting or as part of public hearing, we will unmute all members of the public and I'll ask you to speak in order based on the first letter of your last name. When we unmute the public, please keep background noise to a minimum. You may choose to mute yourself through your own device. If you do not plan to participate at all this evening, we recommend you simply view the meeting live by watching on channel eight or on weaverspeaks.org. If you do plan to participate this evening, when you speak, please first state your name clearly, spell your last name, and give your street address for the record. The time limit for public comment is three minutes per person. Speakers may not donate their time. When there are no more speakers, I will close the time for public comment and public participants will be muted again. We appreciate your patience with this virtual format as with the in-person meetings. Our hope is that we can create a friendly and respectful atmosphere for public dialogue and we appreciate your help in this process. Thank you. I'd now like to call the City of Wheatridge Planning Commission for no December 3rd, 2020 to order. Can I get a roll call members, please? Melissa Antle. Here. Christine Disney. Here. Will Kearns. Here. Ari Critchiver. Here. Daniel Larson. Here. Dana Leo. Here. Pat Ohm. Here. Jahi Simbai. Thank you. That is everybody. Okay, thank you. The next item is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. We should all see an image of the flag on our screen. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Before we continue with our agenda, I'd like to explain how we'll be voting on items tonight. Once we have a motion and a second, all commissioners in support of the motion will be asked to raise their hands and to keep them raised and visible until the recording secretary acknowledges that they recorded those votes. After voting, the recording secretary will read the result of the vote to confirm it is read correctly. We we'll use this protocol for any voting scenario tonight. Is there a motion to approve the order of tonight's agenda? You're, you're muted, Commissioner Larson. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the order of the agenda for tonight's meeting. Is there a second? second. Is there any discussion? Call for a vote. Motion approved, eight to zero. Okay, the next item is the approval of minutes from November 19, 2020. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the minutes from November 19, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Call for vote. One abstain. Motion approved, six to zero with two abstaining. Okay, we are now at the public forum. This is the time for any person to speak on any subject not appearing on tonight's agenda. You will have a maximum of three minutes to speak. Speakers may not donate their time. Please give us your name, spell your last name, and share your address. We will now unmute all participants. Please keep background noise to a minimum. If you do not plan to speak at this time, you may mute yourself through your own device. Is there anyone wishing to speak whose last name begins with a through E.
I'm just going to, uh, instead of going through the alpha, I'll just ask, is there anyone else that wishes to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda? Please speak now before I close the public forum. Is there anyone signed up to speak? No one has their hand raised in Zoom. Okay. I will now close the public forum. We have one public hearing tonight. Um, uh, for the public hearing, we will be adding the appropriate staff and when applicable, the applicants to our video feed. Their screens will be shared or presentations are being made. They will remain a part of the video feed until the conclusion on the respective agenda items. After the presentation, the commission will ask the questions of staff and the applicant, and then they will conduct the public comment portion of the hearing. This will be conducted in the same manner as earlier by unmuting all our public participants. We typically administer an oath for any participant in a public hearing, staff, applicants, and the public. In this virtual meeting format, we are administering that oath in a different way. If you comment during a public hearing tonight by choosing to testify, you are agreeing that the testimony you give will be the truth as you know it. I now open the public hearing for case number WZ-20-02 and WZ-20-03, an application filed by the Industrial Partners Qualified Opportunity Fund, LLLP, for approval of the zone change from planned commercial development to planned industrial development with approval of an outline development plan and specific development plan for the development of an industrial warehouse located at 4990 Marfette Street and ask for the staff report. Good evening, planning commissioners. It's good to see you all. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and the video presentation, um, the staff presentation first, and then the applicant presentation after. So I think we'll do questions after the two presentations. So let me get this going. And can everybody see that okay? I'll go ahead and play. Hello, my name is Stephanie Stevens and I'm a planner with the City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. I'm presenting case numbers WZ-2002 and 2003, which is a request for approval of a zone change from planned commercial development to planned industrial development the approval of an outline development plan and specific development plan for development of an industrial warehouse. I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The properties within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore, Planning Commission has jurisdiction to hear this case. So noted. The subject property is identified on this slide with the red outline and is addressed as 4990 Parfet Street. It's bounded by Parfet Street to the west, I-70 Frontage Road to the south, Oak Street to the east, and West 50th Avenue to the north. The site is approximately 10.6 acres in size and is currently vacant. It's surrounded by a mix of long-standing industrial and commercial uses property went through rezoning to plan commercial development in 2005 with intentions to expand the adjacent Medbed auto dealership site that lies just west, but the plans never came to fruition and site remains undeveloped. Wheat Ridge Ward commuter rail station lies northwest of the site, approximately three quarters of a mile away. As mentioned, the property is currently zoned planned commercial development or PCD. Most of the surrounding zoning is industrial. Southeast, east, and northeast of the property is zoned plan industrial development. North is industrial employment. And then to the northwest is agricultural one, which contains an existing single family home. To the west is the Medved site, and it's zoned commercial one. And to the southwest is zoned commercial two. The request before you is for a rezone from planned commercial development to planned industrial development. Under the current zoning, the site can only be developed as an auto dealership, so rezoning is necessary. And because of the unique challenges of the site and proposal for a large format industrial building for which city standards do not contemplate, not all standards of the IE zone district can be met. For these reasons, PID zoning is most appropriate. The planned development process entails several steps before development occur. With this application, we're looking at accomplishing all steps listed on the screen. 
Step one, the outline development plan or ODP establishes the zoning. Step two is the specific development plan or SDP, which provides site specific design, which are both step one and step two of focus at the planning commission hearing. Step three is the subdivision, which is being processed administratively as a consolidation plat and is currently under review by staff. First, it will be helpful to get oriented on the site. This is a view from the southwest corner of the site at I-70 Brenton Road and Parfait Street looking northeast. The billboard site is not a part of the subject property. Here's another view from the midway point of Oak Street looking southeast. More photos were provided in the staff report, but this image is reflective of the condition of the long-standing vacant land. We'll start with the Outline Development Plan, or ODP, which establishes the PID zoning. The ODP document is two sheets in this case. The first page is the cover page with certification and signatures blocks. There's also a character development statement, list of permitted uses and development standards, and other standard notes. The development standards is what we'll want to focus on here, and I'll go over that in just a minute. The second page includes the conceptual layout of the property, including access drives and building orientation, as well as architectural standards. The conceptual layout or sketch plan is meant to illustrate general building locations and circulation. I'll go through each of the architectural standards with you here in a moment. As for the sketch plan, this is a required component, but we won't focus too much on the sketch plan because we're also reviewing the SCP, which has much greater detail. The uses permitted per the ODP are all uses permitted in the city's established industrial employment, commercial one and commercial two zoning, with emphasis placed on encouraging industrial and commercial uses that support employment. The table on the screen summarizes the development standards that are being proposed, which are generally aligned with IE standards, with exceptions to setbacks, which are shown to be more restrictive. Note that the rear setback along Oak Street is actually proposed to be larger per landscaping requirements at 40 feet for loading. Keep in mind when comparing to the Medbed PCV site that that site was proposed solely for auto dealership use. The development standards on this slide reflect those that are being requested to differ from or be modified from typical IE standards. I'll go through each one with you briefly to give you some context, but you can find more details in the staff report. The ODP categorizes parking by use with a request for ultimately less restrictive parking than the standard warehouse and sales uses would require by code. And based on comparable requirements for large format industrial uses in other jurisdictions around the Denver metro area. The applicant is proposing two access points per public street to align with fire district requirements and curb cuts are proposed to be a little bit wider to accommodate truck train movements along Oak Street. Landscape requirements are proposed to be somewhat flexible where utilities or easements exist on site, but requires typical minimum required number of plants to be relocated elsewhere on site and to focus our attention of areas of higher priority, such as screening of parking areas and headlights. Enhanced bufferings required up to the northwest adjacent to the residential as well as fencing and on Oak Street on the loading side, an enhanced buffer of 40 feet is required. The ODP also requires a tree inventory and assessment of existing trees on the property to determine viability and those that cannot be saved on site must be replaced at a two to one ratio. The applicant is also proposing a maximum fence or wall height of 10 feet versus the six feet typically allowed to sufficiently screen loading areas from adjacent uses. Architecture, which is the meat of the modifications being proposed and stems from the architectural and site design manual. The modifications are being proposed related to building placement, parking placement, articulation, materials, variation, transparency, and screening, all which directly relate back to the proposed large scale industrial building lying adjacent to three street frontages. Everything else meets code in terms of lighting, fencing, signage, and the like. The SCP is 13 pages and gets into the details of the project. The SCP has to comply with the ODP, and the cover sheet has a table that shows required and proposed development standards. The SCP is proposed to facilitate the construction of a single industrial warehouse building consisting of approximately 142,200 square feet 
The resulting building is speculative and that tenants are not yet in place, but would accommodate businesses of varying sizes and largely target employment related uses of industrial nature as allowed by the ODP. The building's designed for the main facade to front on Parfait Street, with loading on the east along Oak Street. Property will have two access points from Oak and two access points from Parfait Street. Standard parking wraps the building on the north, south, and west sides with a truck court and loading area on the east side. Site access, parking, building height, and setbacks comply with the ODP and are compatible with the surroundings. Sidewalks will be installed along Parfait, Oak, and 50th Avenue. The site's heavily encumbered by easements. As previously mentioned, there's a 100-foot public service company easement on the south side, as well as the Ridge Road tributary. And then on the east is the Bayou Ditch, Arvada Channel, and storm pipes, all which are significant and limit development in these locations. This is the landscape plan for the site. The SCP proposes 26% of the site to be landscaped, including parking lot landscaping, perimeter landscaping, and a decent buffer on the south side. A total of 112 trees and 781 shrubs will be provided. A tree inventory and assessment was performed by an arborist to determine viability of existing trees on site. And all but one, and even that one was determined to not be super healthy, were deemed unviable. So with that, the applicant is proposing replacement of trees at a two to one ratio as required by the ODP. The image on the screen shows a perspective view of the southwest corner elevation looking north from Parfait Street. The proposed architectural construction reflects mainly articulated site concrete panels and glass accents and includes varying parapet heights, textures, colors, reveals, enhanced entries, windows, and features that help to break up the facade. The main entry includes an elevated glass line, enhanced architectural design on the south end of the building, which you can see here. All entries are recessed and include permanent canopies to help break up the monotony of the large scale building. This is a perspective view of the east and south elevation from Oak Street. This is where you can see the loading area along Oak which is proposed to be screened by 10 foot wing walls, which also help to break up the facade. As a requirement of the zone change process, a neighborhood meeting was held on April 21st, 2020 in a virtual meeting format with 14 people from the public in attendance. Notes from that meeting are included in the staff report. Since Wheat Ridge is not a full service city, we sent the application on referral to outside agencies as well as completing our internal review. There are no remaining concerns or objections from outside agencies. Before the hearing, the property was posted for 15 days and letters were sent to property owners within a 600 foot radius. We have not received any calls or emails to date. Before the hearing, the case was published in the newspaper and this presentation was also made available to view on the Wheat Ridge Speaks website. No public comments were received in person, by phone, by email, or on Wheat Ridge Speaks. We use several criteria to evaluate the zone change requests, which includes consistency with the comprehensive plan, which is our major guiding document for land use. A full analysis of the criteria for consideration of the zone change are provided in the staff report. This image on the screen shows an excerpt of the comprehensive plan's structure plan, which designates the area in dark purple as the employment area designation. The ODP reflects uses, development standards, and architectural requirements that will help with economic growth, bring in jobs, and guarantee quality design in line with the employment area designation. Staff finds that the zone change request meets the criteria. It allows for compatible land use, complies with the comprehensive plan, is consistent with the intent of plan development zoning, and is necessary to accommodate a large format industrial land use not contemplated in city standard codes. The SCP also meets criteria for review. The SCP complies with the purpose of a PID, is consistent with the ODP, there's adequate infrastructure to serve the property, and it provides for quality design that meets the intents of our code. Ultimately, staff is recommending approval of both requests. Planning Commission will recommend a decision to City Council who will also review both documents. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now if you could just give me a moment while I load the applicant's presentation. Just a minute.
Okay, we should be ready to go. I'm going to share screen again. Oops. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Mitchell, and I am the Vice President of Industrial for Westfield Development Company. Westfield is a local Denver-based and Denver Metro-focused developer and operator of primarily commercial real estate projects. I will be presenting our proposal to develop a 10.6-acre parcel of land adjacent to the MedVet Autoplex into a Class A industrial logistics facility. This aerial depicts the site located between Parkwood and Oak Street, just north of the I-70 frontage road between the Ward and Kipling exits on I-70. The site is currently used seasonal grazing pasture for John Medved's bulls and is only improved with perimeter barbed wire fencing and a livestock shelter in disrepair. It was most recently subject of a rezone case in 2005 when the city approved an ODP designating the property as a planned commercial development with the purpose of expanding the Medved Autoplex with an additional auto dealership and related warehouse for parts distribution and auto service that was never developed. We are proposing to rezone the site to a planned industrial development to facilitate the construction of a single Class A industrial logistics facility consisting of 142,200 square feet, with the goal of delivering a high quality, aesthetically pleasing building to an undeveloped site that will provide employers the much needed space to create local job opportunities for residents. The project will be a speculative development with no specific end user in mind at this time. However, the intention is to provide, again, a highly functional modern industrial building that will accommodate businesses of varying sizes and would largely target users that need logistics space that can be utilized for distribution, light manufacturing and assembly, showroom, sales floor, wholesale operations, as well as service and supplier or unit businesses. Here you see the current Envision Wheat Ridge Comprehensive Plan. The site is drawn in the employment district as an industrial employment use. The plan lists the intended uses for this district as light manufacturing, storage, warehouse, and other industrial related uses. As such, our ODP as a planned industrial development is based on the industrial employment zoning standards, a few modifications to provide for certain efficiencies and functional design elements that are required for large scale class A industrial logistics facilities like our proposed development to be successful. See here that our proposed planned industrial development is compatible with the surrounding uses that our planned industrial developments themselves to our east, to the north, and uh, IE to the north, and uh, ag use, including an Excel energy substation to our northwest and commercial, that is the Medved Autoplex to the west across the Parkland Street. We believe our proposed development will provide much needed and severely underserved industrial space in the city for the growth of the local business community and the creation of new job opportunities. General rule of thumb in industrial today is that 900 square feet of new industrial space equates to roughly one new job. In, in that ratio at this building, that would equate to as many as 150 new jobs for the city, those job types could be a wide range of business entrepreneurs, wholesalers, engineers, sales team, craftsmen, service providers, with potential pay ranges anywhere from minimum wage to six figures plus. Mixed, you know, the buildings would have mixed use employment. They would have office components, some warehouse, some light manufacturing and assembly, again, depending on who the end users end up being. And then uh, it would also you know, significantly increase the tax revenue for the city. So as an undeveloped, undeveloped parcel of land in 2018, the total tax bill was $19.18. We estimate that uh, in 2022 and beyond, the full, uh, fully assessed valuation, our real estate tax revenue to the city would be $375,000 a year. So to further demonstrate our content with the proposed development, I wanna provide some recent developments Westfield has delivered in the metro area and talk through our actual experience with these. So first is Hub 25, a four building, 420,000 square foot park we built in 2017. It's located at uh, the junction of I-25 and I-76 with very prominent front end on I-25. It ended up leasing to nine tenants, three of which were showroom wholesale users, three were light manufacturers, and three were distribution and fulfillment users. That job created about 300 jobs. 
uh, and that equates to one job per 1,400 square feet. Additionally, the design of those buildings won the 2017 National Tilt-Up Achievement Award in the warehouse distribution category. The second example is Pecos Logistics Park, also in Adams County, off of Pecos Street, just south of the Pecos exit on I-76. It's a seven building master plan industrial logistics park that'll total 1.14 million square feet of completion. It will deliver the first four buildings in 2021, and I've already leased two of the buildings, uh, pre-leased them to, to users. Building seven, we leased to a sales, marketing, and distribution user, that is Pepsi. And uh, the second building, we leased to a wholesaler and distributor of auto parts. Building seven alone, uh, housing corporate marketing, corporate sales staff in, in their officing, uh, office component, and then distribution of finished product in the warehouse, created over 350 jobs. That would be one job for 810 square feet. Again, the aesthetics of this park builds on the award-winning design of Hub 25, but brings more architectural detail and increased, uh, increased amount of storefront glass. So our proposed development brings this same award-winning design and market-leading functionality to this site in Weebridge. The building is designed for the main facade of the building that's run on Carpet Street, but it will offer an elevated glass line and architectural design on the south end of the building for a first-class curb appeal along the west I-70 front of the road. The loading side of the building would then front on Oak Street, facing the existing industrial buildings east of Oak Street, but screened and buffered by a 40-foot setback with ample landscape. With any logistics facility, the flow of traffic and primarily truck trips is always a key concern. In this case, with the guidance of the planning department city, we've decided to uh, orient our ability to put our loading on Oak Street because it will focus the path of our truck trips onto West 50th Avenue to get to and from the property from the Kipling exit on I-70. This path is the existing truck corridor for the employment district, providing safe and efficient ingress and egress from the project that will work with the current alignment as well as the future alignment and design for the Kipling exit. In addition to the economic benefit that our proposed project would create in the way of jobs and increased tax revenue, the project will also design, construct, and fund at significant cost to the development a number of public infrastructure items that will benefit the city and our neighbors. The Ridge Road Tributary, which conveys regional stormwater for Arvada and Wheat Ridge from the regional pond to the northwest uh, into the Arvada Channel will be piped and undergrounded to a fully enclosed system, creating a safer and maintenance-free conveyance versus the open ditch that exist on the site today. We will also extend the Arvada Channel Regional Stormwater System through to the west side of the site to be ready for further extension when the city has the opportunity. The Bayou Ditch, which exists as an open ditch on site, will likewise be piped and undergrounded for a safer and more maintenance-free condition that meets their water degree and design requirements today. With regard to street improvements, the project would further the development of the city's transportation structure plan by expanding or rather extending West 50th Avenue across the north end of the site. We are proposing to dedicate 18 feet more of our frontage along Oak Street on the east side of the property than is required to widen Oak Street to a 40 foot wide ultimate street section that will not only provide the safe and efficient access and turning radius that our trucks will need, but will also benefit our planned industrial develop, uh, development and industrial employment user neighbors to our east and north that rely on Oak Street. We will also provide curb gutter and sidewalk along Carpet Oak and the 50th Avenue extension where none has previously existed. With regard to landscaping and buffer zones, we hired an arborist to inventory the trees existing on the site today. He determined that all of them are either invasive species such as Russian olives and Siberian elms, or are not healthy and viable long term like the cottonwoods along Oak Street. Our ODP does provide for existing trees to be replaced at a two to one ratio with new trees of desirable species for shade, canopy, screening, and quality. Code requires a minimum of 65 on-site trees. We have provided 101 plus 11 street trees in the extended 50th Avenue right away. With regard to landscape buffers provided, uh, we are providing for a minimum 15 foot landscape buffer along Carpet Street. And then at our northwest corner, code requires either a six foot solid fence with a hedge 
or a 15 foot wide landscape buffer. Our design provides both a 15 foot buffer and a continuous hedge with a six foot solid fence. And then again, on our east side of the property on Oak Street where the loading of the building will be, we are proposing a 40 foot landscape setback with ample trees and hedges to screen the loading utility side of the, of the building. We've taken great care to design and orient our proposed building in a manner that will be compatible with and complementary to our neighboring properties. We hope and anticipate that the proposed development will be a, a valuable asset to the city, bringing an award-winning design to a prominent Western Entry Gateway location in Wheat Ridge, providing increased tax revenue, public infrastructure improvement, and much needed space for the business community to grow and create new job opportunities in the city. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. And that concludes our presentations. Okay, let's hear from me, see if the commissioners have any questions. Commissioner Disney. I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Leo. Nothing. Commissioner Antol. Not at this moment. Commissioner Kearns. Yeah, um, my first question is, there's a little, um, jog at the northwestern property line is that uh i don't know is that somebody's house or or what is the what's the little notch in the northwest of the property yeah so to the northwest it's zoned agricultural one a one and it does contain an existing home okay um and then let's see they're making some significant improvements to the frontage row, or sorry, to Oak Street, Parfait Street, and 50th Ave. 50th Ave kind of dead ends at that, or does 50th Ave, is, is 50th Ave planned to go through to Parfait, or does it, I think it butts against that parcel. Yes, Perhaps. so the only remaining part that we'll need to go through is that A1 property that's the northwest portion, but it is planned to go through once that property, if and when it ever redevelops. Okay. I think that's it for my questions for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Simbaya. Uh, thank you. I just want to start with a comment that I appreciate the thoroughness of this report from the staff and applicant um, well done I wanted to start it's a, it's a minor question I think but to Mr. Mitchell applicant um, the, the, the applicant reads as the industrial partners qualified opportunity fund LLP or LLLP I wanted to ask you about that uh, in relation to Westridge could you touch on that a little bit yeah uh, I, I'm glad you asked that question I, I'm happy to address that for you. Yeah, it's, it's a little misleading that a presentation came from me at Westfield and the developer owner of the sites listed as this industrial partners qualified opportunity fund. Uh, as you may know, this site is in an opportunity zone uh, that was created in this, uh, what was it, the, three years ago, the, the latest tax legislation, um, which creates favorable capital gains treatment for new investment in real estate. And um, this is an expensive site. The site's got so to your question westfield is the developer westfield we are we are a small group we've got seven partners uh we office on brighton boulevard in in the river north district and we do only real estate development acquisition and asset management of real estate in denver and the front range um and so we are local and we you know a vested interest in the seeing projects do well long term in in the denver metro area and then the qualified opportunities fund here was a was a required entity that we had to set up and fund to take advantage of the opportunity zone treatment that this project will give us. What that means for the city is um, this is not will not be a a purely a merchant develop 
deeper uh, approach to this project. We are long-term owners and investors of this real estate. You know, we have a vested interest in building it right, doing it a quality job in a high class functional product that will lease and stay leased effectively to high quality tenants because it's our own personal money. Um, and we're obligated to this opportunity zone, if nothing else, to own it for a minimum of 10 years. So you are getting Westfield, a local developer and owner of real estate for the long term. I appreciate that. And I apologize for misspeaking. I said West Ridge. No, that's all right. Um, are you able to talk a little bit about the timeline of, you know, this development in terms of how it's being built and also finding the businesses, assuming that it's approved tonight and goes on to city council gets approved. What's your timeline for the next steps? Um, I will tell you that the timeline for um, the public infrastructure aspect with regard to the Bayou Ditch, the Arvada Channel, and some of our storm infrastructure is immediate. And so we're actually pursuing a, uh, a early site work permit to start the extension of the Arvada Channel for the benefit of the city and piping of the Bayou Ditch to align with the, the winter months when the Bayou Ditch Company has their irrigation ditch shut down, there's no water flowing through it. It allows us to get that work done without having to interrupt their use of their ditch through the site. So it makes our lives much easier, obviously, to get it all done at the same time um, up front. So we're, we're trying to get that done as quickly as possible. Now, obviously, um, subject to everyone's agreement tonight and, and recommendation of an approval, we would go to city council. That's not scheduled till mid-January. And then uh, hopefully they find the value in it and, and it gets approved as well there. We would then turn around and submit building permit and it would be, you know, as fast as we can get it permitted, we would want to get it delivered. So speed to delivery for us, the, fa the faster we get a, um, the real estate built on the site, the faster we can go market and find tenants to occupy the space. So do you, um, so the building you want it to be built before you find clients or do you that's right we would we would build it on, on a speculative nature um we would build it it's a we build it and they will come scenario um that's just what we did at hub 25 that's just what we did at pecos you know we've really studied the market extensively and in kind of the west sub market uh for industrial users in the metro area which would include uh arvada wheat ridge golden um there really is very little to know class A industrial and what does exist is 100% lease. There is a lot of pent up demand for this type of product. You can look at Course Tech Center for the for, uh, interest down the street uh, to your west a few miles, 100% leased, 100% built out. It's a lot of quality high name, you know, ten, you know international paper, Ball, Ball Corporation, uh, Natural Grocers is there, um, Epilogue Laser is there. There's a lot of um, high quality businesses there because they need that functional real estate um, for logistics space. All right, thank you. I, I probably will stop there, uh, Mr. Chairman, except to ask Stephanie, what happened to the bulls? What happened to the bulls? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Ved, Medved, um, you know, his property up off I-70 and, and on the way to the mountains, keeps his cows there and he winters his bulls when they're off duty uh, on this pasture. And they, they're, it's interesting, there's two of them. They are named fortunate and very fortunate. So he is, he is fond of his bulls, um, but he has other plans for them. Um, he's got plenty of property elsewhere to, to winter them. Understood. Thank you. Commissioner Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a couple of questions, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll limit it right now to one or two. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, um, compliment what uh, Commissioner Simbai had just said about the, uh, the extent of detail and the consideration given to the various easements coming through here. I imagine that tackling the question both uh, below ground and above ground easements uh, created a bit of a headache for your, your architects, but it looks like most of those have been ad addressed. Uh, specifically, my first question has to do with um, well, let's start with Oak Street. As you know, Oak Street is half of a street now. Uh, on the east side of Oak Street are various, uh, uh, whether they're warehouses uh, or, uh, but it, it gets a lot of truck traffic now. 
on the east side for some of those businesses over there. And and looks like what you're proposing here is to expand Oak Street to, uh, I guess it, that would be slightly larger than a typical uh, public right of way. Uh, and uh, it, it does indicate that you're going to be putting the two entrances and then uh, curbs and sidewalks along Oak Street. I guess my first question then is, will the widening and improvement of Oak Street be sufficient to handle tr uh, heavy truck, large truck traffic on both sides? Uh, yeah, that, that is specifically why we propose to dedicate more of our frontage to the street than was required by, by city standard. Um, there is, it is likely, it is almost a certainty that some of the trucks utilizing our building will be WB67s, a full full length 53 foot trailer, you know, truck tractor trailers. And that width of Oak Street today, if you were to put our curb cut directly on that width, they can't make that turn in and out um, in a safe manner. Uh, that doesn't block traffic um, today. And so with that 40 foot width, they make that movement. It makes the intersection at 50th Avenue and Oak Street work without uh, crisscrossing trucks, uh, the tail end of trucks into traffic waiting to turn right on the 50th Avenue northbound on Oak Street. It makes it a safe condition. And to your point, yes, the, the businesses directly across Oak to the east are industrial buildings, obviously of smaller scale but the one uh the one between our proposed curb cuts is uh is united um movers and they run wb 67s 53 foot trucks and um they like to park their trucks on the street on the east side of the street and when that's when they're parking trucks on the street you can't get two cars past each other north south let alone get trucks through there and so Ideally, we do a better job of, you know, of being neighbors for them and providing the, the width that trucks get by each other, but also talk to them about maybe not parking your trucks on, on Oak Street for the benefit of everyone. Okay, thank you. And to follow that up, let's look at on the north side, you are proposing to, to extend 50th Avenue from Oak Street to where that property line ends. Uh, there is something, an indication on the, uh, the specific development plan about future construction right at that corner. Uh, but tell me a little bit about the intent of widening 50th when there is no, obviously no street there now. And there are a few, uh, whether I believe they're farms up further to the north that access through that gate there at 50th and Oak. Uh, how are you planning on on, uh, on accommodating their entrances uh, for the people that that are uh, uh, looking to head up north from 50th? So I, I'll start by saying, um, if you look at our site plan, uh, we don't have access coming off of 50th Avenue to service our project. We don't need it, um, and so it's not our desire to bring through 50th Avenue. If we if it was up to me, I would save the money and not extend it but it, it does further the city's plan of eventually getting 50th Avenue to come through and connect from Oak to Parfit, you know, completing the city grid. And so it's really a city requirement to construct our half of that street at the time of redevelopment. So we've drawn it to comply with that. Um, obviously we, we don't own the Northwest corner to square the site that, that would bring it through all the way to Parfit. And so that would have to happen at a, at a later date. And we also don't control the north half of the future 50th Avenue right away. So we could only construct at this time half the street section. So you're correct in observing that in the interim condition, it would be a half street to nowhere. Um, but it is a requirement of the city uh, by development standards to provide it at our cost when you can get it so that it's there to be expanded upon in the future. I, I wonder if we could get staff to comment on that, please. I'm going to share my screen maybe while Stephanie's explaining because I think if you can see more contextually the incremental right away we've been acquiring over the last several decades in this area, you'll um, see the pattern of uh, roadway connections that we're trying to achieve over time. So the subject property is here. You can see my cursor. 50th Avenue, where it's a complete and very wide street where it's adjacent to the Rocky Mountain Bottling Company. And the right away that we've already acquired sort of on the west side of the subject property. And then again, a couple segments that are trying to get connected. So 
um, having a connection all the way through here, whether it drops down or stays north, has long been a goal of the cities and explains some of these sort of incremental right away acquisitions that we've had over time and is why it was required in this specific case. Right, and I do understand your concern. It is unfortunate that we still have that one little piece to actually make it poke through, but until that redevelops, we have nothing to get it to go all the way through at this point, but eventually we should be able to see that happen. So so the end result will be a, a an extension of 50th Avenue that is actually only half as wide as a regular public right-of-way street. That is correct. So the, the developments to the north would then have to complete the remainder of the right-of-way. Okay. Okay. Uh, all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Christopher. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Um, I noted in our materials that, and I apologize if the answers are there and I missed them, um, that in 2005, this property was rezoned to allow for the extension of the dealership. What was the zoning prior to the rezoning in 2005? That predates me and I meant to look that up and I forgot to before this. Um, yeah, I don't know that off the top of my head either. I can look it up while you're asking your other questions. Because I guess I'm just wondering if we're sort of, if it was industrial and we, and it flipped to commercial and then if we're just sort of reverting it back to where it was before. I think uh, if I recall at one point seeing that it was like C1, commercial one, if I recall correctly. And then in 2005, it was zoned to planned commercial development? Correct. Okay. Um, I also noted in our materials that there's a comment um, about the unique, quote, the unique site conditions. And I guess I'm wondering if someone can speak to what that means, what specifically is unique about these site conditions. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to address that for you. Again, back to the reason that this site is coming to you for development now um, has is largely to do with this opportunity zone um, treatment. It, it creates some additional in, uh, room in the uh, risk return metrics of a, of a speculative development that we couldn't have otherwise overcome because of the cost of this site. It's an expensive site to acquire one, which is our problem, not, not the city's, but then, you know, because of the amount of easements on the site, you know, the north, uh, the north property border and the east property border are the Ridge Road tributary, a big open ditch. The south 100 feet are a, a 100 foot easement to PSDO for their transmission lines and having to bring our Vada channel through. Um, the coverage on this site is much lower than we would otherwise be able to make a viable deal um, and we're also having to construct all of those utilities, piping and undergrounding them uh, or extending them at our cost as part of the project. And then on top of that, um, being in this lower basin um, that was at one point decades ago, the North Fork of Clear Creek that no longer exists, the depth to groundwater is about two feet. And so, you know, we're being asked to extend, extend the Arvada channel through, that's a 65 inch uh, pipe that's going to be buried 17 feet in the ground. It's going to be well below water table. So we're going to have to undertake some significant dewatering uh, to get that pipe to one, get in the ground and get constructed and then actually function the way it's intended. And so um, this site is not without its its hair to um, to resolve. Now we have a very seasoned team of, of a great civil engineer that we've done multiple projects with and a uh, very good architecture team and and my partner, Jason, who's done a lot of this work before. Um, we've got the right team to get it done. But again, it, it is a very expensive project uh, to construct. Thank you for that. Um, and my last question, maybe this is um, probably for staff. Um, has there been sort of historically, it seems like this, this site has been sitting vacant for a pretty long time. Has there been any interest or is there any idea of interest in developing it consistent with its current zoning? 
I can maybe take that just because of the history on the site. Um, the previous zoning, the planned commercial development was very narrowly and specifically intended for Mr. Medved to open a Hummer dealership. And at uh, in the 2010 recession, that just was not realistic. And for a period of time, he was not interested in selling. The city actually uh, talked with him a couple of times, knowing that we have a lot of demand for industrial um, developments and users. Um, but he either wasn't interested in selling or it's my understanding that the price was prohibitive in some cases. So we have not had a lot of inquiries um, in terms of rezonings over the years on this particular project um, until it came through as the most serious proposal with this one. Um, thank you. I think those are all my questions. Thank you. I will. I have some questions. Um, I'll start uh, with the staff. If there's something I ask that um, staff can't answer, can you just please ask the uh, the applicant um, and their consultants to to ask answer that question. Um, the first one is on the on the parking. The applicant is asking for significant reduction in in, in parking. How did uh, staff, I guess, feel comfortable? with what the applicant was proposing. Sure, so we had them provide examples around um, the surrounding jurisdictions around Colorado, and I've worked in multiple as well. And with that, um, there, I mean, our code just doesn't contemplate this large of a scale industrial building. So it really comes down to kind of providing that parking study. And that's in the applicant's narrative. If you wanna take a look, there's a couple of jurisdictions noted there. and it really just came down to that our code is a little more restrictive than it needs to be in terms of comparison. Okay. And then how does the city determine if adequate parking spaces are available if the uh, percentage of warehouse or showroom sales change in size in the future? Because the parking would be static. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So we um, we don't just end the whole thing by approving if this is to be approved at site development plan. Um, it would have to come in, each tenant would have to come in for a business license application. And at that time, we would evaluate and track where the parking um, ends up and make sure that they have enough parking on site to, to um, accommodate the users that actually end up coming in the tenant spaces. Thank you. The, the ODP reflects a maximum fence or wall height of 10 feet versus the standard allowance for up to six feet. Where is the applicant placing the 10 foot wall or 10 foot fences? I only see a six foot wood fence on the Northwest corner, um, but it's hard to tell because there's some thick black lines um, like in the, on the landscape plan. So it's kind of hard to read where the fence starts and stops or is so located. On the, um, on the east facade of our building, on the loading side, we're actually going to have, uh, or proposing to have two 10 foot tall wing walls extending out to the east from the, uh, the east facade that would screen the truck loading um, from the north and south and, and, and partially from Oak Street as well. Um, so that would be integral to the building, not necessarily a fence around the perimeter of the site. We are not proposing to build a screen wall fence around the exterior of the site at this time. However, we are uh, hoping to allow ourselves the flexibility if we had a tenant that said, look, I, I would love to lease the north half of your building, but I really need to be able to store um, trailers or containers or whatever it may be in our truck port. Um, well, we, we wouldn't wanna allow that because it would be unsightly unless we had a 10 foot screen wall where you could not absolutely not see any of that from the exterior of the site. So with that, with that 10 foot wall, could that potentially be on the north side? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, one of the other very, there's a talks about the material va variations where the city requires three, but the applicant is unable to provide three. Could you please explain? Yeah, I may ask um, Ken Harshman with Gray Wolf, our architect, to, to um, help address that one. But it, really, it comes down to function and efficiency of an industrial building of this scale. And so the durability and structural integrity and, frankly, the function, particularly with regard to the loading side of the building of a con concrete tilt wall industrial facility this size, 
was doesn't allow us to have many other materials really. And so in lieu of um, providing, you know, brick or metal panel or um, some other kind of stucco, for instance, that gets impacted with, with trucks, you know, backing up to loading docks and, um, you know, the nature of an industrial building, um, we provided additional uh, articulation, plane depth um, breakup, uh, and then using form liners in the concrete panels to provide texture, grooves, depth, uh, reveals, and, and different colors as well. Um, it, what it does is it breaks up the visual scale of, you know, 40 foot tall uh, concrete panels on the, on the outside of the building. You can, maybe you can do a better job than I can of, of giving an, an architect's uh, perspective. I would just want to echo uh, everything that Matt has just spoken to. Um, oftentimes, we're, you know, we've, we see requests to provide multiple types of materials. And, and what, what can happen is the cohesive nature of the building design actually begins to fall apart because you're just adding random materials to, to try and meet a particular code or a particular standard. And, and in this case, as Matt had mentioned, we've been very, very careful in selecting the colors on the building, the placement of those colors, uh, different form liners, which are really just a uh, create a different kind of a pattern and a texture that, that from a distance kind of emulate different materials. Uh, you know, for example, uh, from a distance, you might think some of those darker colors of, of blue are actually a, you know, a metal panel because of the shadow lines and the, uh, you know, the relief that it begins to provide in there. And then we did create some very specific focus areas on the building with the corner entries, uh, the canopies, which are, are technically made out of a, a third material being metal. But uh, we really wanted to strive for a, a very unique and, and cohesive uh, design for this project. Thank you. Um, I have some questions on... Break in real quick. Um, Mr. Harshman, can I get your address, please? Um, yes, we're with Gray Wolf Architecture. The address is 1543 Champa, Suite 200, uh, Denver 80202. Thank you. The next, uh, I have some questions related to landscaping. Uh, if you could bear with me here. So on sheet six, uh, there are three evergreen trees off the northeast corner of the building that, I don't know if you could um, show that on the plan. So it's sheet six. I can pull the plan up. Matt, do you want me to um, bring Julie into the um certainly it would be helpful she's okay. our she's our landscape architect to help design this layout and and obviously by virtue knows it better than anyone i'll bring her up while stephanie's loading the plan sheet yeah i'll use the enlargement so we can see it a little bit better Let me know when she's um okay uh, she's I'm ready sorry about that okay are you, so, are... I, I am here I, okay but I do get your question yeah so on on the sheet six there's uh three evergreen trees um if you could pan over with that hand to the left where the trash is yeah it's a little bit to the right it's like right yes, in the middle of the screen. I see those, um, right in the, the middle of the screen. Pines. Yes, um, those appear to be about as wide as a parking space. So about they're showing about ten feet wide, um, and they on your plans you're showing them at a mature canopy of twenty two feet. I, I've seen them at thirty foot wide canopy, uh, which may overhang that sidewalk, outgrow their space, but they're also going to grow to about probably at least 40 feet tall and they would create uh, a shading problem over that pedestrian sidewalk because it's planted on the, the south side of the sidewalk. Um, and I guess my question is, is why 
was that type of evergreen and evergreen trees placed on the south side of that sidewalk um, as opposed to some other type of deciduous tree yeah that is that's where one of those um wing walls that are really tall to screen the loading area so i wanted to break up that visual line okay. and also help screen uh the loading area to the south. And then if we can move to um, the southeast, or if you could go to the next sheet, sheet seven. It's just, we have a similar issue where we have evergreen trees, they're next to that wing wall and they're on, they will potentially create icing problems as they mature and grow to 40 feet tall because that'll be a really shady spot um, is why why those specific trees were were shown there I, it was kind of for the same reason just trying to maximize screening of the loading areas okay and then on the on this same sheet if you could pan over to the far left where the monument sign is um i noticed there was uh there's some verbiage about efficient irrigation. There's that sod area that is created has some really sharp, acute angles right there, which are going to make it potentially make it difficult to irrigate. Um, I was just wondering why why those sharp angles right there. It's kind of to the east, to the right of that monument sign. Yeah, I see that. Um, the the grass was added because the detention basin was changed to underground detention. Okay. Um, and so we wanted something like green and more lush at the entry to kind of highlight or be the foreground to that glass um, view of the main entrance of the building. So uh, I certainly can change the edge there so that it's not sharp edges if that's needed. Um, Okay. And then south of that is the more of the meadow grass area. So the idea is that the meadow grass then um, is an easy transition to the grass that's mowed. And we actually don't necessarily need to have an edger between the sod grass and the meadow grass. Um, that's more of just a line that shows the demarcation between those. I have no objection to the edger. Um, and then in the, if you could scroll, I think on the sheet seven, there's a seating, seating note number five. Um, I think it's in the, is it on this sheet? Yes. Uh, number five, it says, it talks about for slopes steeper than three to one or greater. The other sheets say the landscape cannot exceed four to one. Um, does the city allow and this is, a, I guess, a question for staff. Does the city allow seeded slopes on, or any slope over three to one? I believe our maximum slope is four to one. Okay. Um, and then on the other question is on the same sheet, if you'd scroll to the far left along um, Parfet Street, there's, I was looking, I saw it, I really noticed it on, don't scroll the, the sheet 61, but on the, um, on sheet 61, it was showing that there's existing overhead power on Parfit. Um, and you can see it on here, there's, there's a lack of like street trees. And because there's, um, it, it does show it on sheet five, it says that there's uh, overhead power. Was that, was that the city? the applicant or the um, or PSCO that determined that they did not want to have those power lines undergrounded? That is not a requirement of the city for those to be undergrounded. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, does the two to one replacement tree ratio only apply to one tree? Um, no, it applies to all the trees that exist on site today. So I believe there's 55. But it, but I think those trees were excluded because 
they were invasive species. And so it, I, I thought it only applied to one tree that was applicable. So if they can't be replaced, they need, to, or if they can't be saved, then they need to be replaced at a two to one ratio. Can the, uh, can the applicant's landscape ar architect um, confirm that? Yes. So even though the trees were in poor condition, uh, the PUD required that it, um, all trees that were existing, if they had to be removed, be replaced at a two to one ratio. So regardless of their condition, we, we counted the total number and replaced them at the two to one ratio. Yeah, that, okay. that includes invasive species as well. It's not just the non-invasive, un, but unviable. Every tree on, on the site is being replaced at two to one. Was that, the, was that a city requirement? That is not a city requirement, no. Okay, because because typically Russian olives are an invasive species by the state of Colorado, and so uh, I'm surprised that you would have to replace those at all. Um, and the Siberian elms are a non-native species. But there was during the review there was suggestion by staff to evaluate the existing trees on site and mitigate what they can. So that is what what the result was from there. Okay, so it was this a. Uh, is this a an applicant self-imposed? That's one? right. It was. It was trying okay. to, you know, taking a undeveloped site with trees today and replacing it with a development, but also trying to be landscape and environmentally friendly. That it's still aesthetically pleasing and and screened appropriately. It's. It was trying to make give it, you know, a better landscape appeal than the minimum requirements. Okay. Um, that is all the uh, that is all the questions that I have. Do any other uh, commissioners have any further questions for staff or the applicant? Can I get Julie's um, last name and address, please? Yes, uh, the last name is Wolverton, spelled W-O-L-V-E-R-T-O-N. The address is six one nine four five Night Hawk Road, which is. One word is Nighthawk, Montrose, Colorado, and the zip is 81403. Thank you. Oh, oh, just a second. I had one last question. Um, why, uh, something that Commissioner Larson had brought up, why does the, the landscape along, for the streetscape, not continue on West 50th towards the, the A1, the property line, and what is labeled as future construction. So it's there's future construction on one of the sheets, but then on the landscape, the that streetscape landscape just kind of dead ends. I'll share my screen again so we know what we're okay. talking about here. Okay, so this one seems to continue. Are you it's it's only in the streetscape. So if you look at let's see, sheet um, four. If you look at sheet four on the far left, it's orientated differently, but um, there's a pink oh, area. Oh, for this portion? Yeah, I, I can answer that for you. Um, yeah. And it, there is, so just like the bayou ditch um, crosses the, the southern end of our site in an open ditch format, that also, that is the Wadsworth ditch. That is an open ditch today conveying uh, irrigation water to water rights owners downstream and we have worked with planning and, and public works and, and the city engineering team to construct the, the half section of 50th avenue short of that open stretch of the wadsworth ditch because of the grade change north of the of our property line where 50th avenue gets built so if we were to try to pipe and underground that section to finish 50th Avenue all the way to the property line at this time, it would have to be torn up and all redone when the north half of 50th Avenue gets added and the rest of the extension to Parfet Street comes through because of the elevation, the grade changes and the water wouldn't flow the way it flows today. And so effectively it's leaving the open ditch open today. So it continues to serve its purpose until the city acquires the rights to the rest of the right of way to get the street built at which time it'll need to be piped underneath the street. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Larson, you have a question? Yeah, and, and uh, this again relates to the issue that 
uh, is underlying a lot of the uh, difficulties, I guess, that are challenges that that the applicant was facing in terms of developing this, and that has to do with this fairly high uh, water table. So I guess that it's a fairly simple question. Do you plan on, on having anything subsurface uh, within the property that uh, could be affected by this? Is there going to be a basement in the building? Uh, anything like that? No, there won't, will not be. This the, the foundation system of this building will be spread footing around the perimeter to, to, to support the panel walls. And then the, the floor itself will be slab on grade. It will be uh, that we will bring some fill dirt on the site to raise that slab on grade so that the dock high loading on the east side is 48 inches above the pavement for a truck to load efficiently. And so we will raise the site and none of our foundations of the of the physical building will be in the water table at that time. The, the only time we'll be touching water table during the construction of the site will be getting the Arvada channel uh, extended through and constructing our below grade detention. And that is also the reason why we're doing below grade detention instead of a surface pond is because any surface pond, and you can look at some of the existing ponds around the neighboring properties are full of water all the time not and not functioning the way they are intended to function because of the, the, the shallow water table. Well, that, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. I appreciate that. And then uh, one one last question: uh, the uh, triangular shaped property that is along the frontage road, were you not able to acquire that? It would seem like it would make a lot of sense to have that part of the development. Um, you would be right, except for with the with the hundred foot easement for PSEO, we are not allowed to build inside that, obviously, because of the proximity to the transmission line. So we couldn't gain any coverage. And two. We did talk to the outfront media guys that own those two parcels there and have their billboards on sign on site. They are not sellers. Uh, that is uh, highway gold for those guys. That is a very valuable triangle of dirt for their billboards. I would love to not have billboards in front of our facade of our building, our glass line. <laughs> Believe me. I, I can appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Kearns. Uh, one quick question. Regarding Oak Street, so it's currently a sort of a half street on the east, sort of east of center line. When you go to build it, do you only build the west side of it or do you rebuild both sides of the center line of Oak Street? So there, there is curb and gutter on most of the east side. Now, a lot of that's been really beat up from the, the moving company parking their trucks on, uh, along that curb over time, just by the nature of the heavy trucks. But um we are only required to construct our half street obviously because of widening the street we'll be constructing more than that half street but we also are required to um to mill and overlay to patch in the new asphalt into good quality asphalt on the east side so there will be some additional pavement across the center line to make sure that the end end product is a good quality street okay and it really shows that you guys are putting together a high quality product. This is a really nice looking warehouse. Uh, it really kudos to you guys for sort of breaking up the, what's usually blank walls on warehouses. And I like the wing walls you've added. The landscaping looks great. Um, the entryway looks really nice. It's a really, and for a warehouse, this is a really sort of a, an architectural, a really nicely architectural building. So good job. I appreciate that. Again, being a speculative building, it may very well go, you know, the southern end of the building may very well go to a wholesaler that wants to have a showroom to sell finished goods and, and needs it almost a quasi retail feel to it. So it needs to have a nicer curb appeal than just a standard high throughput, low finish distribution. I mean, we want higher quality tenants in our buildings. Great. Great. Any other questions from any of the commissioners? That's it for me. Thanks. Um, just to go back, I believe it was Commissioner Kirchhofer that asked about the previous zoning from t before 2005. It was partially A1. I'm thinking I didn't get the actual plan up, but I think that was the north portion. So that parcel that's next to the existing A1 and then the rest of it was C1. So it transformed due to the area changing basically is what I got from that report. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commissioners before I open up the 
Pollock. Okay. I will now open up the hearing for public comment. If you wish to comment on this case, you will have a maximum of three minutes to speak. Speakers may not donate their time. When I recognize you, please give us your name, spell your last name, and share your address. Do we have an idea how many people are speaking? Um, we have maybe seven or eight folks in okay. the audience. I believe maybe half of those are with the applicant team. Um, so I am unmuting everybody now. So probably have okay. four. Please keep background noise to minimum. If you do not plan to speak at this time, you may mute yourself through your own device. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Yes, I'd like to speak. Please uh, give us your name, spell your last name, and give us your address. Yeah, my name is Charles Stiesmeyer, S-T-I-E-S-M-E-Y-E-R. And uh, I live in that little uh, wedge up at the northwest corner with that uh, house on uh, A1 property. Can I get the address, please? 4996 Park Vet. Thank you. Um, I've lived here since 1998, and the from almost the moment I bought this house, uh, Wheat Ridge had a little burr up its uh, on its saddle to move 50th Avenue through. Now, I fought that for 20 years, and I'm still fairly young, so I imagine I'm going to live here another 20 years. So don't get too excited about putting 50th through. Uh, the other issue, besides the fact it would have wiped out my place on three quarters of an acre. Was that by the time 50th heads west and hits Parfait, that's right at the very bottom of a very substantial hill. So uh, going west on 50th to try to go north on Parfait would be nearly impossible unless some more properties are purchased, really all the way up and down the street. So that was a massive uh, expense that we just didn't want to take on at that time. We, I've been fighting that since Jerry DeTulio wasn't even mayor yet. Last time he cast a deciding vote saying we're not putting 50th through at any time, and I was relaxed, and then it just keeps coming up like a bad penny. Uh, the re uh, you put 50th uh, on the north side of that warehouse, it will not come to my property as long as I am here. And uh, if you put 50th in, which is an unnecessary expense for the developer, that will simply be used to park trailers as I've seen in a lot of uh, warehouse developments out east off I-76 and I-70. The other comment I have was that my main comment is lighting. I do not want to take a look at a bare light bulb on a wall or a light bulb, a bare light bulb in a parking lot that has not been shaded uh, so that I come out and it looks like you're in a prison yard. You're seeing bare lights everywhere, which if you want to drive a parfait and look at Medved's parking lot, that's exactly what I have to see every night when I walk out the door. I asked Medved to shade those, and I can't uh, tell you his response in the, uh, in the public because it wasn't very nice. Also, I don't believe Medved owns that dealership anymore, but that's just a, a side comment. And the other final comment I have is I don't know why I haven't seen the details. Is there a fence or some dense... Uh, uh, trees or bushes between my property and the warehouse or is it was there a wall there at all or is there not oh and the other final comment i had was when this came through in march when covid first started apparently there was a parking lot directly to the east of my property but i haven't looked at the details and i don't know if that's it was a circular prop, prop, uh, parking lot where everybody could drive through and there were lights in the middle of it so i was thinking okay here we go more prison lights over there and i haven't looked at the details so i don't know if that's still there or not so those are my comments thank you who do we have next that's it. anyone with their hand raised we do have one other um caller if if you're on the phone and you'd like to speak, you can unmute yourself uh, by hitting star six. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? Please speak now before I close the citizens forum. I'm 
I'm not seeing anything. Okay. I will now close the citizens forum and uh, we just had one speaker. Uh, so let's get back. Let's start with the, um, the lighting. I, um, is there any light spillage? Uh, it sounds like the main concern is that Northwest that, um, that is beyond the property lines that would be unacceptable to the city. So our code um, requires that you don't have light spill on adjacent properties. If you'd like, I could show the photometric plan, but it doesn't have any spill onto the adjacent properties. And then in addition, our lighting regulations require that all fixtures be shielded and downcast. So the intent there is that you wouldn't have the glare that um, is assumed. And if there was an issue with that, that would be a code issue. Could you could you quickly just put that sheet up? I think sure. it's sheet eleven. Yeah. Share. And and just if you could zoom in on that um, northwest corner. So here's the adjacent property line right here. And we're not getting any spill outside of there. This right here is just that street light that's on um, Parfet Street. So okay. that's not on site lighting. Yes. The closest lighting fixtures are the ones along the building here and then the street lights. Okay, thank you. And then there, please confirm that there is a, uh, a fence and what that height and type is at there's that corner. A, yeah, there's a six foot fence proposed between just on this Northwest side. So on both property lines that on the South of his property, as well as the East side, six foot solid fence landscaping and then a, a 15 foot required buffer on that side. Okay. And then our, um, our semi trucks allowed to park, I guess, on this site. They, well, I, I will tell you on the, on the carpet side, on the 50th uh, Avenue side, by virtue of the turning dimensions, functionally they won't be able to they may be able to get in there they'll never be able to get out and so it, it, it is prohibited by site design not by rules necessarily okay so it'd just be maybe on oak yeah it, it is sufficient enough and we've done gone through it with our bad fire department for the turning radius for fire trucks okay. not for full-size truck and trailers where they can come through the parking and that yeah part of that is the is the design of the of the building to separate it separate uh, auto uh, access on Parfit and their circulation of the building from separate from trucks, just as a pedestrian and a, and a vehicle or safety measure as well as, you know, anytime you can separate auto traffic and truck traffic, it is a much more efficient and safe site for everyone. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions to the applicant or staff from the commissioners? The only thing I'd like to add, Mr. Chair, is that um, Mr. Steismeyer was on the phone, so he may not have been able to see the plan sheets that we were pulling up, and we'll certainly uh, coordinate with him and provide these updated okay. drawings if he's interested in those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay, I will now uh, entertain a motion. Just real, um, Mr. Chair, sorry, yes, uh, Commissioner Disney, we're going to do two motions, I guess. Yes, right? yes. So I'll start with um, on page thirteen of that packet. We're going to it's the ODP first, yeah. correct? Do you want us to read both or take turns? We're, we're going to do one at a one, one at a time. time. Yes, because okay. the because the my understanding is that the. The SDP will not fly if the ODP does not pass. I'll do the first one. Okay. I move to recommend approval of case number WZ-20-02, a request for approval of a zone change from client, planned commercial development, PCD, to planned industrial development, PID, with an outline development plan, ODP, 
for property located at the northeast corner of I-70 Frontage Road North and Parfit Street, 4990 Parfit Street, for the following reasons. One, the proposed zone change will promote the public health, safety, or welfare of the community and does not result in an adverse effect on the surrounding area. Two, the proposed zone change is consistent with the goals and objective of the city's comprehensive plan. Three, the proposed zoning is consistent with the intent of a planned development compatible with surrounding land uses and will result in a high quality development. Four, the criteria used to evaluate the zone change supports the request. Support. Five, the proposed plan development is necessary and appropriate to accommodate a large format industrial land use, which is not contemplated to the city's standard zoning codes. Mr. Chair, I'll second. Okay. Uh, any discussion, and this is just on the, the zoning, the, the zone change, the ODP. Is there any discussion on that? And Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I'm still a little bit new to this process. Would this mm -hmm. be the appropriate time to just make comments about? Yes. Y yes, and try to please try to focus mostly on the, the zone change because the next one is going to be on the SDP, the site development plan, and then there's, there's more specific things we can talk once that motion goes through. There's is it pointed out, so. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I would say about the zone change, I'm struggling a little bit because it sounds like this site has historically been zoned. Part of it was, was A1, part of it was C1, which also comports with pieces of the surrounding areas. Um, there has been some concern expressed by, it sounds like at least one and maybe some of the other residents from the earlier public meeting about the zone change and the planned development there. Um, and so I guess I'm just gonna put it out there that I'm a little bit concerned about um, going in that direction. Do any other commissioners want to comment on that, discuss? I'll make a comment. Um, I see no problem with the zone change because if you look Unfortunately for the gentleman who has uh, a home with a small acreage there, um, it's commercial and industrial. And that area of town, I do believe, will continue to be developed um, because it's a desirable area now. And I have uh, absolutely no concerns with it. I think it's appropriate for the area, the area, the way it is trending, and I, I support it for that reason. I think, uh, Mr. yeah, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I, I would, I would like to also comment uh, that uh, first off, I agree with Commissioner Disney, and I believe that given the, the investment involved and the, uh, the challenges faced. Uh, on that particular property, it makes more sense to have uh, an industrial site there than try to to develop something into a commercial development. Uh, while it would be appropriate because it is bordering on the commercial uh, the commercial zoned area, have it zoned having it zoned as industrial does make a lot of sense given the the amount of investment that would be involved that will be involved in developing the site. Any other discussion? Sure. Um, I'll, just, I'll just echo that as, that as well, because I think if you look at how an area transitions over time, particularly in Wheat Ridge, where we are seeing a lot of transition um, as we grow and change, you know, what may have been in the pro what the property may have been zoned as 10 to 20 years ago probably isn't as relevant because our community has changed so dramatically during that time. And so if we look at most of the surrounding development at, um, near that property is industrial. And, and I, for one, I'm glad to see that Wheat Ridge is one community that is embracing um, protection of some industrial areas. So we continue to attract 
um, a stable employment base through uses like this. Um, you know, so, I, so just thinking about as we grow and change, you see a lot of communities getting rid of their industrial areas. Um, just as Mr. Mitchell had mentioned, um, it's becoming very difficult to find areas where you can actually build warehousing, supplier, distribution centers. Um, you know, so I, I support this change um, and see that, you know, because of the constraints on that site, it would be really difficult to get a um, modest commercial development to really pay for the improvements necessary to make the site feasible for development. So not to just poly all it back on you, Ari, but, um, you know, certainly, you know, I, I do think it's been a sound kind of direction that they're heading with this zone change. I, I feel comfortable that uh, this is not a straight industrial and Commissioner Antos is right, there is on the east side, there is adjacent um, industrial uh, and looking at what the applicant has shown in the past, the Hub 25, um, that doesn't necessarily appear to be like a straight industrial either. It's a little bit of a hybrid of having, uh, they talk about showroom and sales. Uh, and so I, this, this seems like a good fit for this particular area. And when you're looking at um, industrial too, I would think that they would want access you know, to I-70 and we could kind of, you could check that box. It's next to an interstate, it's got roads. Um, I think this would be a good, good fit zoning wise for the city. Is there any other discussion? Okay, I will call for a vote. This is uh, in favor. motion passed eight to one right eight to zero okay i would now ask for a motion for the specific development plan uh, mr chairman i move to recommend approval of case number wz20-03 a request for approval of a specific development plan on property located on the northeast corner of I-70 Frontage Road North and uh, Parfit Street uh, for the following reasons. One, the specific development plan is consistent with the purpose of the plan development as stated in section 26301 of the city code. Number two, the specific development plan is consistent with the intent and purpose of the outlined development plan Number three, the, the proposed uses are consistent with those approved by the outline development plan. Number four, all responding agencies have indicated they can serve the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense. And number five, specific development plan is in substantial compliance with the applicable standards set forth in the outline development plan and with the city's adopted codes and policies. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Yes, Commissioner Disney. I would like to echo some of the comments made earlier this evening about the um, detailed nature of this presentation, both by staff and the applicant. I think that this is a very attractive, very beautiful building that will really improve that corridor and you can tell that we're moving up in the world because you're going to attract high quality tenants in a development such as this and it's kind of exciting that you are willing to invest the amount of money it's going to take to develop this property um, and so thank you for to staff and to the applicant for their work on this project Thank you. Any other discussion from the commissioners? Um, one little thing, you know, this this is going to create a lot of jobs within an employment zone as laid out by the comp plan. So not only is it creating a lot of jobs, it's, you know, within a long walk and a short bike ride from the new transit oriented development, the, the light rail station. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited as well. Thanks. 
any other comments from the uh, question? Mr. Yes, Commissioner Larson. Mr. Chairman, just one last comment. And I, I think the this is a wonderful first step in getting that, that parcel uh, moving. The, the concerns that I think face, that will face the city is the, the next sort of the next step because we have, it, it's sooner or later, there's going to have to be some sort of a decision made. We heard from our, uh, our neighbor, Mr. Steismeyer about his sort of ongoing uh, conflict with the city regarding extension of 50th, 50th Avenue and maybe the city may want to reconsider that or reroute it or, or uh, do something, but there are a number of issues with that extension of uh, 50th Avenue that will have to be addressed sooner or later. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question back to Stevens, um, considering that the applicant wants to have a 10 foot, 10 foot wall um, and that contradicts with uh, the following reason number five that uh, that some substantial compliance with the city's adopted codes and policies. That does not substantially comply. The city's code says six feet. Ms. Stevens, could you provide some examples of where a 10, 10 foot walls are allowed in the city? So it's hard to think of specific examples, uh, but I do want to clarify just that the wall is actually attached to the building and our code is written um, to direct directed towards freestanding walls is my interpretation. Um, so this would be normally subject to building height requirements rather than fencing height requirements. So the, the applicant has stated they want a 10 foot perimeter wall. No, there's nothing on the plans with a 10 foot there, perimeter wall. No, but perhaps the applicant could confirm that. That's what I thought I heard was that they wanted a 10 foot wall to help screen perimeter wall to screen trucks, and I didn't hear specifically the oh, wall. I apologize if I if I wasn't clear earlier. No, the um, to Stephanie's point, we do have ten foot uh, wing walls attached to the building to screen the loading positions on the east side of the building at the north and south end of the truck court. Um, there, but th there was also a desire in our writing the ODP that in the future if we had a tenant that would like to have some component of outside storage, there is no back of this building because it faces public right away on all four sides. Um, and so if they needed to store something in their truck court, um, we would, we, we would, we had, we'd have the flexibility to allow them to do so subject to putting a fence in place that screens the view of it from the street. So you wouldn't drive down Oak street and see them storing, you know, like think, think about pods, for instance, those guys that they've dropped the box off in your driveway and you move all your goods into it and then they store it for you until you have a home for it. Um, those guys love to store those pod containers out in their truck court when they're at capacity or where they're staging it for trucks. If, for instance, that was a potential tenant in the future, we could do that, but also do it in a way that's screened from view from our neighbors and from public right away. And so it was just to allow future flexibility, not knowing, um, who the, who the ultimate user might be. And it's not, we're not proposing to do any kind of 10 foot wall um, around the perimeter of the site today. It's unlikely too, but it, you know, again, trying to, trying to be flexible to meet as wide a universe of potential users for a successful project is, is kind of our goal. Thank you. Ms. Stevens, it sounds like he's the applicant wants the option of having a 10 foot wall in the future. In the, if I may, in the okay. truck court area, that would be permitted. So the six foot requirement is pro, is a maximum when we have a fence or a wall that's serving a divisional purpose. So it's on the property line or it's within the minimum setback. But once so it's the setback, it's the it's uh, subject to the maximum height requirement. So if if there was a screening of the truck court, um, it's within that area that's sort of stippled in the site plan. It's not on the property line or within the landscape buffer. Could you could you show me a uh... I'm trying to visualize this. Could you show me in the sheet where this would possibly go? Yeah, let me grab that SDP real quick. Okay. I 
Okay, so the east side is Oak Street here. Here's the wing walls at 10 feet proposed height. Here's the truck court area. So it wouldn't be perimeter fencing or setback area. And you can see that east side is heavily encumbered by easements anyhow. Um, but he's talking about potentially within this truck court area. Is that correct, Matt? That's correct. Inside the loading area of, of the building. So from, from the, the building wall to the back of curve of the um, of the truck okay. court on the on the west side of that 40 foot landscape buffer to Oak Street. OK. Um, I would be supportive of having a 10 foot wall there if we could somehow word that uh, as a condition that's a little more specific so that it's never interpreted that it's a perimeter wall. Is that something staff could write up or, I mean, I don't know if it needs to say that it's shall only a template wall shall only be allowed as part of the, the building's wing walls in the loading that loading area that or or that it's it we cannot the template that. wall cannot cannot exist in the landscape areas right or property exactly. line so if you want to make a condition that um that we had more specificity in terms of the permitted location for the 10 foot wall then we can wordsmith it to meet the intent of what we've just talked about that the wall's not on the property line or in that landscape buffer does that that so since I made the motion, um, can I just add a number? Uh, so, you know, we condition. Yep, we added. We had five conditions. Can I add a sixth condition? Do I need to make a motion to add a sixth con condition, or can we let Commissioner Ohm make that motion? Or I can't make a condition on the chair. So, okay. So we can have somebody um, suggest that commission or suggest that condition as a friendly amendment and then that would require that commissioner Kearns and I believe the second was commissioner Disney if you both agree to that condition that someone needs to make um, then it would be tacked on to your original motion <laughs> okay. I'm right with it yep I'm I'm okay with it do you need me to say what the condition is if you're okay with what I articulated that we staff will add more specificity in terms of where that 10 foot high walls is and is not permitted to be, then I don't need you to restate it. That, great. that sounds great. Thanks. And then, and then a very, very small possible condition and this may or may not be a condition is what, what would happen down the road on that tiny little corner that says future construction someday if that gets built, it, does the property owner automatically just install the landscape um, on that or extend that? How does that work? I mean, I don't even know what the timeline would be for that future construction. It could be a couple of years. It could be 20 years. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? That little rectangle. It's, it's hard to say sort of what that's going to look like. We would, we would either contribute. We have sort of a missing sidewalk um, fund where we sometimes fill in the gaps in terms of funding gaps in streetscape or sidewalk as a city if we need okay. it. But to this question of sort of when does that go through, it's been in incrementally uh, dedicated as right away for decades, and I would expect that it continues to be incremental over decades. The distance between the frontage road and Ridge Road is nearly a half a mile, which is why there's a desire to have at least something um, bisecting those two streets. So I think it'll take a while to be hard to know exactly what that looks like. Okay, I don't know that we need that as a condition then. Um, does anybody else have any other discussion or concerns? I also want to reiterate what Commissioner Disney said. This looks like a, it looks like a really nice building um, where we can kind of see what's been done in the past with the Hub 25. Um, the their architecture uh, looks really nice. So great job in the architecture. Um, it, it's, it looks like a real, I can tell it's a really tough site with all the, um, the existing encumbrances of the, the underground utilities, the, you know, some of the proposed uh, trying to reconnect back for the storm sewers. It's a, uh, it makes it, a, it makes it a tough site. Um, but I think uh, in the end, this will be a, this will be a good fit for the city, a good project. So I will I will be voting yes to that with that condition. Thank you. 
If there's no other questions, I will ask for a vote. This is four in favor. Motion passed eight to zero. Thank you, everybody. Okay, the next item on our agenda is old business. Is there any old business? No old business. Is there any new business? Our only new business is that we do plan to have the meeting on December 17th. Um, it'll be just a single agenda item to discuss code amendment related to short-term rentals. That'll be uh, kind of looking forward to that. That'll be exciting. Been in the works for a while. It's been sort of on and off of council's um, discussion topics for almost two years now. So setting a record for code amendment, but it'll be a, a good one, I think. And uh, uh, Lauren, when would that be available for review? Uh, we're just wrapping up the staff report now to post on We Urge Speaks and we'll deliver the packets to you by email next week. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items for new business or any other discussions? Not for staff. Okay. Fellow commissioners. Okay, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. I motion we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay, call for vote. Motion passed eight to zero. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.